right, for our uh, Resurrection Sunday message today, let's turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, we'll be reading verses 19 and 20. What would you say if I told you that on Easter there were 10 men huddled together in a room in a state of fear? Would your first response be that they're simply uh, following the governor's directive on this Easter day? Worried about the coronavirus? Or perhaps, and you may know where I'm going with this, you would realize that this is exactly what the first church was like on that first Resurrection Sunday. There are many large ministries who are canceling their church services today. And so all around the world, there are small groups huddled together around their computers, in most cases, rather than gathering at their church home. As we think about this first Easter, let us consider how similar our situation is today to what it was like nearly 2,000 years ago on that first resurrection morning when Jesus had risen from the dead. John chapter 20, verses 19 and 20, says, In the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come today in this small gathering here at Calvary Baptist in Clintwood, and we pray that you'd speak to us as we read your word, as we meditate on your word. And Heavenly Father, just like the sun is coming up, so too did your Son, Jesus Christ, rise from the dead, and it made all the difference. Impress the truth of Jesus' resurrection on our hearts. And may it truly transform us as we think about this amazing event. Help your preacher today to bring the message for the hour. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For the followers of Jesus this day, their Messiah had just been crucified and buried. However, there were reports coming in from a few women and some of the disciples that not only had they seen the empty tomb, but they'd also seen the Messiah, Jesus Christ himself. And that's where our text begins. It says here, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week. This was the afternoon of the same day that Mary Magdalene, had seen Jesus. This was the afternoon of the same day that the two disciples on the road to Emmaus had seen Jesus. And here they were, here they were, gathered back in this upper room on the first day of the week, on that first Sunday. And what were they doing? You know, well, they were probably uh, huddled together They were probably praying. They may have been comparing notes with each other. They may have been considering the evidence of Jesus' resurrection. They may have been simply trying to figure out what to do next. But there they were, the church there, huddled together in the upper room. You know, this really sets the pattern for us as Christians. This is why we worship on the first day of the week, rather than the last day of the week or any other day of the week. We worship and we rest. Some would call it our Christian Sabbath. Because here they are, gathered together, the followers of Jesus in that upper room. If you go down a few verses, um, in verse number uh, 26, it says, And after eight days again his disciples were within. And so they gathered on that first Lord's Day, the first day of the week. And then on the eighth day after that, which is literally what the Greek says there, 
They were gathered again on the first day of the week. You go so many days later, and you'll see in chapter 2 of Acts, you see the day of Pentecost. That was the first day of the week. We see in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, we see in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, the first day of the week when the disciples were meeting together in order to pray and to hear preaching and in order to give as well. And then we see over in Revelation, chapter 1, verse 10, it says that John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And at this point, when it says Lord's day, people just assume that they meant the first day of the week. The day of the week when Jesus rose from the dead. You know, the thing is, we emphasize the resurrection of Christ, typically on Resurrection Sunday, also known as Easter. But every Sunday, every Lord's Day, is a recognition of and a celebration of the fact that our Savior, Jesus Christ, rose from the dead. You know, if we apply the fourth commandment to Sunday, then we ought to seek to do all in our power to set aside every week that first day for the purpose of rest and worship. And I don't care, you know, if you're in, in a church building like we are here today, or if you're in your home, that precious first day of the week when Jesus rose from the dead ought to be set aside for rest and for worship. And we're looking forward to the day when we can come back together in this building and worship Christ. And you know, it doesn't matter. Huddled in the upper room, in your home, huddled around a computer, <laughs> or here in the church building, the promise stands true that Jesus said in Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. You know, it shouldn't be a surprise after hearing Jesus' words there because that Jesus is about to show up. Because Jesus always shows up when we gather together in his name, wherever that may be. And so we look at our text again. It says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were were shut. The doors were locked from the inside. The door was shut. The disciples were assembled. Why were the doors locked? Well, it tells us in our text, for the fear of the Jews. Perhaps they were barricaded in that day because they were scared that the Jews might hunt them down and might turn them in like they did Jesus, and that they too might face a similar consequence as Jesus, their master. But you know what? Huddled in a locked room, afraid, and we know that fear is the, the opposite of faith, afraid, gathered in the name of their Savior, Jesus Christ. It says, Jesus came and stood in their midst. Now, as I was studying for this message, I didn't realize this. But there's a lot of controversy about how Jesus got in the room. <laughs> Some people say that uh, he uh, miraculously caused the lock to go away and that the door quietly opened and he quietly walked in. Other people believe that in his new body, he just walked right on through the door. I didn't realize there was such a debate. But, you know, that's the same thing with, uh, you know, what day did Jesus die? You know, I believe he died on what on our calendar would be Wednesday. But the most important thing is, why did Jesus die? You know, Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, the Bible says. In the same way, it doesn't matter how Jesus miraculously ended up in this room. The fact of the matter is, he ended up there because his disciples were gathered together on that day. By showing himself to be alive, Jesus gave the greatest proof 
for his resurrection from the dead. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is that great resurrection chapter. The greatest proof of Jesus' resurrection is the fact that so many people who were alive then saw him alive after they had seen him crucified and buried. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all he was seen of me also, that's the Apostle Paul, as one born out of due time. You know, people say, well, what was the great motivation in the early church? Why were they willing to risk their lives to preach this message of Jesus dead and buried and risen again? And the answer to that is simple. Because these apostles who went forth had seen the resurrected Christ. Many others had seen the resurrected Christ. And if you had not seen the resurrected Christ in that first generation it is very likely you may have heard someone give testimony of seeing the resurrected Christ. Over in 1 John, we see a testimony of uh, John the Apostle. Speaking of Jesus, it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. I've seen him with my own eyes. I have heard him with my own ears. I have touched him with my own hands. And so John and the other apostles and those who were converts to Christianity went forth. We have seen the resurrected Christ or we have been with those who have. So what is Jesus' message to these apostles? The first thing he said. Well, some have said that this is a common greeting, but nothing is ever common when Jesus says it. And so he says here in our text, verse 19, Peace be unto you. In the midst of fear, Jesus speaks peace. Peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace within ourselves, that peace that passes all human understanding, and then peace with others. John 14, 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The world's peace. You know, during this time of turmoil we find ourselves in, the world's peace doesn't do you any good. I was talking to someone and he said he'd lost, and this was before it bottomed out, he'd lost $30,000 in his retirement plan through all these stocks plummeting. You know, you see people, you hear about deaths, people dying of this coronavirus, and there's always a fear that it may spread even in these areas where it hasn't spread as of yet. There's fear because our health is on the line. There's fear because our finances are on the line. There's fear because our nation's security is on the line. You see, when everything's going great, the world has peace. But when things are not going so great, 
When our lives are in danger, what does Jesus say? My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. Because see, good times come and go. But Jesus says, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Whether in life or whether in death, Jesus never fails. And Jesus is always with us. John 16, verse 33, warning his disciples before he had to leave. He says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. It's like that bumper sticker says, K-N-O Jesus, no Jesus, no peace. But in O, no Jesus, no peace. In this world, you're going to have tribulation. <laughs> Jesus told us what this world was going to be like. And yet in Him, we can have peace. Because we know whether here or whether there, He is with us and we will be with Him. So what did Jesus do in that upper room that day? Verse 20. And when He had so said... He showed unto him his hands and his side. The marks of the nails in his hands and the mark of where the spear pierced his side proved who this was who had mysteriously appeared in that upper room. Dr. Luke gives us a few more details in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, beginning of verse number 36. It says, and as they spake, the disciples, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? Why do ye thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Handle me, see, for a spirit has not flesh and bones, as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy, in other words, they just couldn't believe it was true. <laughs> That's what that means. And wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and of a an honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. This shows that Jesus was not just a spirit or a ghost, but he had a body, a glorified body. It says, uh, verse 44, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, in the prophets, in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. I would have loved to have been there hearing Jesus open up the Scriptures. <laughs> and one day we will. And I look forward to that. Verse 46. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And here's our responsibility. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. Jesus rose from the dead. He received a new body. As we proclaim Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection from the dead, we are to call other people to repent for the forgiveness of sins through the power of the indwelling Spirit. You know, Jesus also said, and I didn't read this last verse, in verse 49 of Luke 24, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. 
ye are my witnesses. Ye shall be witnesses unto me, Jesus said before he ascended. In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, into the uttermost part of this world. And how do we witness? How do we have that power? Because on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, came down and it dwelt the believers. And on that day, he filled the believers. And he lives within us as well. You know, it's interesting here. In John chapter 20, Jesus may have received a new body. But you know what? He retained some of the old scars. Even in eternity, the Apostle John saw Jesus in Revelation 5-6 as a lamb as it had been slain. Think of this. As we look at Jesus throughout all of eternity, we will be reminded from the nail prints on his hand, in his feet, and the spear mark on his side, we'll be reminded of how he saved us from our sins and how he, by paying the penalty for our sins, made us worthy to receive eternal life. Bible commentator Matthew Henry says this, Conquerors glory in the marks of their wounds. Christ's wounds were to speak on earth that it was he himself, and therefore he arose with them. They were to speak in heaven, in the intercession he must ever live to make, and therefore be ascended. he ascended with them and appeared in the midst of the throne, a lamb as it had been slain and bleeding afresh. Nay, it should seem he will come again with his scars, that they may look on him whom they pierced. There it is. On earth, the scars say, it is I, it is I. In heaven, the scars say, I have paid the price for their salvation. And when Jesus comes again in glory, the scars will say, you, your sins are the ones that I'm judging now because they are the ones that nailed me to the cross. What do we see in verse number 20 of John chapter 20? What was the reaction of the disciples? Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. I invite you to turn back a few chapters to John chapter 16. Verses 16 through 22. The amazing thing about Jesus is he doesn't give us a rosy picture. <laughs> He's very honest with his followers. And so before he went to the cross to die, and he was fully aware that he must needs go to the cross, it says in John 16, beginning of verse 16, A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, ye shall see me not, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me. And because I go to the Father. In other words, what's Jesus talking about? That's what they were saying. They said, therefore, What is this that he saith? A little while we cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and so he said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said? A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. Ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish, for joy that a man is born into the world. The picture here of a woman giving birth, the pain she goes through, and yet the pains are nothing 
compare with the result of a little child. That's what Jesus is saying. Verse 22. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. I like that phrase there, your joy no man taketh from you. You know, a lot of times we say, well, I'm all upset. Or perhaps even you're angry. And you say, well, he's done this or she's done this. Well, if you're a Christian, nobody can take that joy from you. Only you can give up that joy. <laughs> and so Philippians says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. The disciples were glad when they saw their Lord. Once again, Matthew Henry says this, A sight of Christ will gladden the heart of a disciple at any time. The more we see of Christ, the more we shall rejoice in Him, and our joy will never be perfect till we come where we shall see Him as He is. I read an illustration recently in a magazine, a man who had been in the ministry many years. He and his wife had been married for many years as well. And they said at one time it was a very turbulent time in their marriage. He was working like 50 hours a week and then trying to pastor a church as well. And Anyway, he said that finally he got some things right with God, him and his wife. And so he started coming home and he wasn't as irritable and things like that. But one day, as often happens to us, he came in and was like his old self, where he was just irritable and grouchy and all this sort of stuff. And his wife asked him this question. She said, did you pray before you came in? <laughs> and he just walked out, spent some time with his Lord, came back in, and she was the good wife. She didn't remind him of how he came in the first time, and everything was okay. The disciples that first Easter morning or evening, I'm sorry, that first Easter evening, spent some time with Jesus. They saw the Lord, and their joy was restored. So the question for us today is this. Are you cowering in fear like the disciples were cowering on that first Easter Sunday? You know, Jesus invites you on the first day of each week, to gather with other Christians. And at this time, that may just be in your home with your family. And he promises to show up whenever two or three are gathered together in his name. And it is a joyful thing for his people to be in his presence and to hear the Lord Jesus Christ speak to our hearts Peace be unto you. Peace. Peace with God, peace within, and peace with others as well. You know, as an interesting thing, at his birth, what did the angel say in Luke 2.14? Something very similar. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill, men. The Prince of Peace has come. The Prince of Peace has paid the penalty for your sin. The Prince of Peace has risen from the dead. And as we gather together, as those apostles were gathered together that first Easter, mor Easter evening, I keep wanting to say morning, that Easter evening, he's speaking the same thing to us today. And that is peace be unto you. That is the message for this Resurrection Sunday. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, our living Lord Jesus Christ, the one who paid the penalty for our sins on the cross, the one who was buried, the one who rose again that glorious third day. Help us to hear his voice this Easter morning 
as he says to us, Peace be unto you. Help us by faith to trust that he is our peace. He has made the way for us to have peace with you, Father, to have peace within ourselves, even in the midst of tribulation, and also to live at peace with others. Help us today to remember the truths from that first Resurrection Sunday. And then, Lord, as the coronavirus lifts, help us to be faithful to be in your house every week on that first day of the week, worshiping you and resting in you, celebrating our resurrected Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.